Um, welcome back from lunch, everybody. I hope you enjoyed those delicious sandwiches. I certainly did. Um, we've got two sessions this afternoon, and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. John Stone. Um, Dr. Stone is a lecturer in transport planning and urban planning program in the Faculty of Architecture at the University. Oh, sorry, Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning. Oh, it's a long, it's, it's a long top faculty name. <laughs> Um, at the University of Melbourne. His research seeks to improve public transport performance in Australian cities through a greater understanding of the professional practice and the political and institutional context for public transport planning in similar cities in Canada and in German-speaking Europe. He is currently pursuing opportunities for greater exchange between Australian practitioners and their international counterparts. John's research has identified many opportunities for more effective and efficient public transport in Australian cities through better service coordination and more efficient network design. Since completing his PhD in 2008, his work at Melbourne University and at the Swedenborg Institute for Social Research has been funded through grants including an ARC Discovery Project and a Commonwealth Endeavour Research Fellowship. This work follows over 20 years' engagement with public transport management in Melbourne that has included work in local government and the community sector. Please welcome John. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks for all coming back after lunch. Great to see you here. And as Andy said, it's fantastic to actually be in a room with people instead of everybody with a square box around their head. Knowing how tall people are, knowing what people look like in three dimensions, it's, it's fantastic. Um, I think the most important part of that introduction is that my work has been both in academia and in local government and in the community sector. And what I think I've learned most through that is that if we're going to get anywhere, we have to build alliances. And it's fantastic to be here with the MTF, who's been one of my strongest allies in my individual practice. They helped fund my PhD back a long, long time ago. But also in terms of the work we do collectively to, to get change. And that's the one. Yeah. And also, I'd like to acknowledge that we're here on Wurundjeri land and really to re re reiterate what Jonathan said in terms of what, we, what it means for us as transport professionals to be thinking about land which people have moved across in various ways for many, many thousands of years and that a lot of the tracks that we look at today, our roads, our railways, follow patterns of movement that, that go back that long time. So we really, it's incumbent on us really to think about the, the footprints under the footprints that, w that we make today. What I want to talk about today is how important public transport is and Innes gave us a fantastic lead into it by saying that our duty as public transport planners and local government officials, wherever we work in this area, is to think about the care that people need to express to the, their families, to their communities, and the reciprocal sort of networks of care that our transport system needs to engage with, and that public transport is so important in playing that role in, in people's lives, in connecting people. I'm going to talk specifically about the west of Melbourne, but this is a, an issue that faces people right across Melbourne. But particularly in the west, where communities are forced to bear the brunt of long periods of poor investment, poor planning, which means that people don't have the opportunities to connect their lives in the way that they need to. Well, living in Werribee, there's very like limited um, buses like near my area. I think there's one near Riverwalk. I live near Riverwalk, but not enough that like the bus would drop me off there and then I could walk to my house because it's too far away. And because there's no buses, I have to go to my local library and wait there for a really long time until like six o'clock. And so like my parents can pick me up from the library. So I think there needs to be... Um, a bus way closer to my house so I can get home from school. Uh, I think it'd be a huge, like, significant change in my life because, like, um, going to the library has been a part of my life since year seven. So I've been going there every single day since year seven and it's, like, really draining. So I think it saved me a lot of time and a lot of effort. 
The West deserves the best. The fact that we can tell stories like that, and there's many, many stories like that, about what it means for people to not have good public transport. Just imagine, as an adolescent, that you had to sit in the library every afternoon after school till six o'clock. What are the things in your life that you would have missed out on? And for her to say it was a bit stressful, I think, is you know, beyond understatement. And Friends of the Earth have been collecting those stories and amplifying them, and it's a really important part of the work we do, telling the stories of what it means for people to not to be able to connect. This is the network, to use the term loosely, of bus services that is currently provided in, in the West. And it's... We'll look into it in a little bit more detail about what you might do to it and what it means in terms of accessibility. But basically what we've tried to do is to spread the resources we have as thin as possible so that everybody has a bus stop within walking distance. And that's the, that's the measure. People in this room probably really understand that very well. The measure we have is that you're within 400 metres of a bus stop, not within 400 metres of a service that takes you into your community that connects you. So we really have to fundamentally change that measure that the government uses to decide whether we have enough service or not. And to get as many people close to a bus stop, we spread the resources really thin. We have very circuitous routes. We have routes which run very infrequently. And that gives us a pattern of use that Jan here today, very familiar, is author of these maps which he and his colleagues have done for cities all around the world but which basically say given the public transport system that you have in that system that in that city how accessible is that community and for most of the west it's the service provides almost no connectivity at all so and even in the best parts of the west footscray we're still getting to you know, good on an international scale. There's cities with similar sorts of structures to our own where large areas of this, the suburban hinterland are actually in at least yellow, if not red and green, and in some cases the dark green. So it's not impossible to do that, but we haven't done that yet. But we do have some ideas about what we might do and uh, you know, I'm a transport planner to some extent. I don't get down in the, the depths of transport planning like Knowles and others, others here today who really use the software to come up with networks which do actually connect people. And one of my colleagues, Ian Laurie, has done that work for the West. And instead of this spaghetti of services, what Ian's done is to try and just simplify things and it's very much a rudimentary look. It's not what the Department of Transport would do. It's not what uh, you would deliver. It's not what something like Anthony would go to the public with in, in, in New Zealand. But it's a conceptual imagining of what you could do to just show you that it's possible. And so what Ian did was to use the Remix software to say, what happens if we just put the buses... And there's one of a friend of mine who saw, saw some of the media that we've been generating around this with, with our allies across Melbourne over recent times. He said, oh, you're getting the buses to run fast in straight lines. Exactly. So if we do that, if you simplify things onto the existing road network and a slightly expanded network that connects things in a bit, a bit better you can actually give people a service that runs seven days a week, every 10 minutes to midnight, using existing resources. Now, you, you would want to extend your, the resources that you put in into a politically acceptable solution because this would mean taking bus routes out from various streets and therefore a political backlash. So the minister 
wouldn't want to stand up in front of you and say, this is what we're going to do. So there's a transition to this. But this is just to show you that we're not talking about mammoth increases in funding. We're talking about reallocating the many millions of dollars that we already spend on bus services. And it gives you a coverage within 800 metres for almost everywhere in the West. There's some gaps there around sunshine, and so you'd tweak things to, to fix those things. But this is just what we were able to do with the limited amount of resources that the university gave us to actually investigate this possibility. And the sort of things that this, this means for Werribee Plaza, the existing system and the network that, that Ian put together in Remix and the maps that the, the software gives you shows that at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning, within 30 minutes, you can get to Werribee Plaza from a much, much larger area. So that means young people can go and work in retail there without their parents having to drive them. The parents can stay at home on Sunday morning. Think of that benefit to both the young person and the, to their parents. It means that people can get to, their, get to the shops without necessarily using their car. And the principles of that are the things that the minister mentioned about frequency and uh, information. But the, the other thing that she didn't mention, which I think is interesting, is that she, it's about connectivity. It's about being able to get from one service to another. So this gets you to the, the stations. It also allows you to, to move from one bus to the other. And then for people who don't have the ability to walk 800 metres, you need a service for them. We're not saying everybody has to, to walk, but we need an alliance with councils to, to make that walking better. So I, th I think one of the asks from local government to government to say, if you're going to do this, part of it is we need money to, to upgrade pedestrian facilities. But we also need the accessibility for, for people who, who can't use the existing system and we have to get away from the system where those people are actually paying 100% of the cost while the rest of us have subsidised public transport. So we've put together this in this paper. You can find us on, online. That whole story is told, told there. But more importantly, rather than just being academics telling a story and putting it on the university website, it's beholden on us to actually go out into the community to help build alliances to get these things happening. You know, we know that the government has its bus reform plan, but unless there's voices to say, actually do it, we're going to be in a, a difficult situation. And so we know that Infrastructure Victoria are moving towards recommendations later this year, very similar to the ones that, that we've come up with. And the Committee for Melbourne, the organisation that represents the establishment of Melbourne, the big companies, the big businesses, they, with the help from Laura, who's here, and myself and, and others, have written a report which basically says, we understand that the big issue for Melbourne is what happens in the suburbs. The fact that people are disconnected from, for, for business from opportunities to spend money and to work, that's a real problem for businesses in Melbourne and they've recognised that. And so they know that the missing public transport in the, our middle and outer suburbs is a, a fundamental problem for Melbourne's livability and they were willing to put their resources behind this report, which basically says the same sort of things that we're saying, get on with the reform, get those fast, frequent and direct services happening. And the Victorian bus plan says that's what they want to do. But we all know how often you can see things in a government plan and how often the steps between that and implementation are well, things fall over, things don't happen. So when you take a lesson from all the places in the world where governments have said these things and we have seen the implementation, what's happened is that there's been really strong voices from the community, from business, so 
It's really important that the Committee for Melbourne is saying this. It's really important that local governments are saying this and, and the work we've been doing in the West has been really actively supported by, by Wyndham, by Brimbank, by Melton, by Hobson's Bay. And that's absolutely important that, that we provide a united voice because if we don't, then this will remain something that we'll look back on and say, that would have been nice if it had happened. But we really have to redouble our efforts to put the resources into to making government do what they want to do. I mean, there's a, an old story of one of the American presidents say, saying, yes, you've convinced me, now get out there and make me do it. And we're absolutely in that same position. We'll, we've got the, the words, we need to get the action. And so one of the key ways that I've been working with this, this action and really to encourage people to understand what's been happening in the communities in the West and how important they've been in, in getting this momentum for change is that Friends of the Earth, you know, often seen as a, a you know, pro-renewables sort of out there on the fringe sort of uh, community group, but they really understand that climate justice in the suburbs depends on having a good public transport. It, it depends on people having alternatives to using their car. And so that social justice ethic has been behind what Friends of the Earth have been doing in setting up their Sustainable Cities campaign and their Better Bus campaign to amplify the voices, like the, the voices we heard from the young woman earlier, um, this voice from Mount Atkinson where they have no bus service. So this woman has to get her kids to and from school. We have students talking about how they can't reliably get to their lectures even in Footscray, let alone into the, the city. So articulating that and building that into local, you know, for people like Tim Pallas, the absolutely important politician who uh, controls the purse strings and whether, whether money gets spent on something like buses. What these community organisations are doing, the, the small community groups brought together by Friends of the Earth and working with councils in the lead up to the election and since has been to make sure that wherever Tim Pallas goes in the western suburbs, he hears people saying, we want bus reform. It's not that this is something that, that we that people don't want. And so one of the limits to what the community can do is resourcing. And so what I'd really encourage people to do, and I know this is already happening within some of the councils in the West, and uh, perhaps it's something that the MTF can look at more widely, how do you bring resources from councils into these organised communities who are saying, we want this? because that's where the strength comes. So I'm really, really happy to talk to people about how to make contact with this and what resourcing would actually make a difference. And one of the things that, that the people in the West are doing is seeing all the words being spoken about the bus reform plan and pilots and they're seeing things perhaps happening in the northern suburbs, the northeastern happen suburbs or in Mildura. They're saying... We're still being left behind. So what they're saying is you could actually do something now in the West. You don't have to wait for this long process that the bus reform plan outlines about looking at the contracts that are coming up in 2025 and making savings from those and then thinking of ways that you might re reinvest those savings in better buses. CDC, one of the big companies in Melbourne, operates a large majority of the, the buses that run in those circuitous routes in the West. And it would be possible for the government to say, sit down with CDC and say, the community wants us to act on this faster. What can we do within the existing contracts to reorganise the bus routes? This is a conversation that could be happening right now. And that's what, what the people in the West are saying to us is, don't leave us behind yet again. This is something that could be in place, in t at least in very nearly to, to implementation before the, the next election. It's something where you, the government could say to the West, 
I know we're not delivering you the airport rail, we're not delivering you the, the Western Rail Plan, but we are delivering you better buses. So just to conclude, really the message is we have to do this in alliances and it's, you know, the MTF is a, a central part of that, of building alliances through your connections to all the local councils and the local communities. But we do have the academic community behind this, we do have the business community through the Committee for Melbourne, we have Infrastructure Victoria, and we have a network of really strong community groups saying we want this. So all the pieces are in place, so let's figure out how we put them in t together over the next little while and build on the really positive attitudes the Minister showed this morning and, and turn that into to action in next year's budget and the budget after that. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, so uh, I'll start off with a question while you're all thinking of yours. Um, so it's the one we've been asking everybody, actually, so you've got a bit of a heads up. Um, if you were reneg renegotiating bus contracts, what single metric would you add? Um, connectivity, really. Wh where can you get to? What would this do to Jan Snamit's map if you introduced this? How much of the West could you make go green? And that's really the, the measure. Um, and a reminder to those of you playing from home, please use Slido to put your question up. Uh, the contact details are on the screen now. Um, and it's lovely to hear from Simon, but we hope there are other people out there with questions as well. So um, have we got any questions in the room? Um, so it, like I said before, I'm from the Mornington Peninsula and we have um, a, a woeful bus service. I mean, we've done better thanks to the help of MTF. Um, but I'm really interested in the issue of transport equity because I think a lot of people think of the Mornington Peninsula as somewhere where like millionaires come to play. But we have five of the um, most disadvantaged um, towns in the whole of Australia. Um, so I'm wondering how we as a how you would recommend us as a shire advocate for um, on the transport equity platform. I think Innes told us that it's about care. It's about explaining to people what public transport is for. You know, it's not about you know, getting people to work on time. It's, a, it's about knitting together people's lives and it's about telling it through the stories of what, those, what it means to those people. Because once you do that, then you, people go, oh yeah, I get it. And it's about keeping it in that frame of public transport is the way we care for people in our community. Um, we have a question from Bernadette George from Mildura. Welcome to, from Mildura. Um, John, are you happy to answer the question at the top there? Yeah, good point. <laughs> uh, yes, I think that you know, it's in Germany recently and they have a wonderful campaign which is about little legs, short distances. So... <laughs> yeah, and it's about saying, well, we want people to be independent. We, you know, we know that for um, for adolescents, their mental health is one of the biggest challenges that we face as a community is young people's mental health. What we don't connect that to is the lack of transport options that they have. It means that they are dependent as that young woman was an extreme example, but it's true for everybody who gets picked up and taken everywhere they go, that they can't travel independently. They have to travel in a way that's dependent on an adult, and that is no good for their mental health. So I think it's another way of framing what we're looking at is we're here to look after the mental health of young people, and that means bringing communities and schools closer together. Uh, do we have another question in the room? Oh. No, no worries. Um, hi, I'm Sophie. I'm from the one of the councillors at the city of Yarra. Um, 
it's interesting how you've described that, you know, you've got all the pieces and, and I feel like that's something I've seen from Yara is I'm looking at all these pieces line up in the West about why it's such a good idea to have a better bus network, um, but it's still not happening. And, and my question is how can those of us who are better served by public transport help? Yeah, I think it's, it's about saying we need equity, but it's also, I think you have to be careful not to say we've got it great because, you know, I live in the, the inner north, but to get to Alfington from, you know, I, there's one bus that goes that way, but it, and it's, there's only one that runs in the evening. So getting across town, even in the inner city, is hard. So we need connectivity across Melbourne. So I think it's part of saying this is something that all of Melbourne needs, but the people of the west ne or the people of the outer suburbs need it first because they absolutely have no other alternatives. So it's about using the collective networks of the MTF to, to really say this is a number one issue for, for how Melbourne looks after its, its citizens and that's what we expect governments to do. Amanda, and then we'll come back to you, Laura. Yeah, yeah. Um, I certainly uh, am a supporter of, uh, of better bus networks. Um, my, I've got uh, children in that age group, the 20s and 30s age group, who would normally travel, you know, who, who just use cars because there's no frequency in, in buses. Um, my my son lives out in uh, the basin. There's nothing. Mm. Um, so wouldn't we be, be better to spend more uh, on bus infrastructure and, and uh, bus services, connecting those buses into the ends of the railway and tram lines mm. and running that frequently every 10 minutes, uh, seven days, if we, ca if we could instead of embarking on these massive um, infrastructure projects like the Suburban Rail Loop, which is only going to provide services between Cheltenham and Box Hill at, at uh, something like $200 billion in cost. Yeah. Redirecting resources. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I mean, we're, it's redirecting how we spend the big capital money but also about how we redirect the operational money. But, and one of the things is that having decided to build Metro Tunnel, which has its, perhaps in planning terms, a lot more pluses perhaps than the suburban rail loop, but, but it's not going to get all those people to fill those new long trains if we rely on people walking or driving to the stations. They're only going to get the bang for their buck if we organise the rail, the bus system, to feed people into those those stations, and that's that's exactly what this our network's about, and it's what we really need to see in in as a just a vital dot point in the sort of planning of these big infrastructure projects is how are people going to get onto these these new trains. Thanks. Hi, John. Thanks for your talk. Um, sort of in answer to... Well, it's a question for you, John, in answer to Sophie's question, but a few councils have passed motions in support of Better Bus, so Maribyrnong and Brimbank. Does that help? And is that something that other councils can do, even if they're not in the West? If not already, maybe you've already done that. Don't know. Sure. I think that sort of thing raises um, understanding in the community of what the council supports. It's... It's the first step. It's you know, how do people know that Maribyrnong or the other councils have made that resolution? So what are the councillors doing to have that voice made more public? So how can they resource their community to express that voice more strongly? You know, it's it's that that's an absolutely great first step. But it's really you know, how do we make enough noise? that the government can't do anything but connect our communities. Okay, I'm Jan Shira from RMIT University. Um, just on this debate about uh, 
better bus services versus more rail infrastructure. Um, I actually, with a tool that you um, thankfully presented here today, John, his name is, um, we actually, during the pandemic, um, in times of boredom, actually did a little project with Peter Parker and his useful bus network, which is very much a similar exercise to what you presented from your colleague, um, but for the whole of Melbourne to actually create a bus system that is useful for people in high frequency. And um, one of the things we realized is that you can't really separate um, improving bus services and also improving the rail system because it still works as one system. Yeah. It works as one network. Once you actually get better bus services, these people will also be found on trains. And when you find the trains aren't running often enough, then you're going to run into a massive capacity problem. So it's not just about uh, filling those long trains <laughs> with more bus, bus feeder services, but also having more of those long trains so the bus feeder passengers yeah. can actually be accommodated yeah. there and that in some cases would actually require massive infrastructure spending yeah. um, over and beyond what we're currently talking about yeah. or doing with um, yeah. with the uh, metro rail tunnel and the suburban railing sure sure and I think that was Anthony's point this morning was that it's network 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 and it depends what our ambition is if our ambition is to get the people in the west using public transport to the same degree that people in the inner suburbs do, that's great, but it still might not be what we need to do to, to deal with car, climate change. So, yes, we've got to set our ambitions pretty high. Back to Sophie. That's okay. That's fine. Um, I also had a question, and the, that just reminded me, and it was something that came up during the New Zealand presentation as well, is we often kind of talk about you know, where's the most efficient spend of our transport budget and redistributing bus networks or taking it from rail. Have there been many studies and or do you think there should be talking about roads? Like, I think we sometimes pretend or society seems to think that we, we subsidise people on public transport and we don't subsidise people on the road and we subsidise people on the road all the time. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, a, it's about what do we spend, how do we get our transport needs met, how do we care for people, how do we connect people and building new roads we know disconnects people, puts them further apart, it puts the things they want to get to further apart. So it's the whole pool, it's the whole way we think about the, the, the transport system, absolutely. John, a bit off topic but Every council in this state, and especially in this city, as soon as they see a bus stop, they go and plant a tree right next to it. It stops the people waiting at the bus stop from seeing the bus coming and leaves the bus stop driver, he only sees the person at the, tram, at the bus stop when he's on top of it. Yeah. Why do they do that? <laughs> Explain. <laughs> mm. let's, let's assume that they're doing it from the best motives rather than just having the truck there at the same time. Well, the best motives might be somebody needs some shade when they're waiting for the bus, particularly if they're waiting an hour. So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, all of those things need to be put together. You, you need to have shade in the street. Our streets need to be safe, shady and fun so we can actually use... Yeah, but you've got to get to the bus stop. <laughs> the question that uh, Amanda <laughs> asked is why did they demolish a mature tree to put in a bus stop? Yeah. I don't know that John's going to know going the answer there. to that. The bus stop, you know, further along. I think one of the themes that I'm hearing out of this conversation is about, uh, and it comes to the richness of our lives, which is the nice way of putting it, and the nasty way of putting it is the busyness of our lives. And a lot of the time when we're talking about communication, and that's a large part of our conversation today, um, there's kind of an outsourcing of communication that's done either from residents to councillors, from councillors to officers, from officers who talk to other officers, perhaps in a different department. But it's about how do we make sure the conversation and the engagement goes as wide as possible so that we're all moving forward. And I think that is very much a challenge for us You've done a vast amount of work in that engagement side of things and you keep doing that work, John, good on you. Um, but it's the sort of thing we can't ever actually let lie. 
we have to keep at it. It's like doing um, right to school day. You can't stop it after six years because you've actually got a whole new cohort of kids that come in every year. We have to keep on this topic and keep pushing it because it's a bit of the squeaky wheel syndrome, but we can't outsource it. We need to be probably a bit more politically astute and engagement astute. That's not a sentence I know, sorry. Um, to, um, to make sure that this stays front and centre within the politicians' minds and we make them do it, as per your quote. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Are there any other questions? Um, Slido people, people out of the room? Um, OK, well, we might hand back to you, Sarah, to thank, and then we'll do a little bit of shuffling up the front so that we can get ready for our panel. Oh, Knowles, you have a question for John? I, I was reflecting on your <laughs> comments there, Jane. So very, they were good comments. And I bumped into Peter Parker the other day at the coffee shop. I said, oh, Peter, where are you off to? Uh, he's off to Dandenong Market, which is a great place to go. But um, he had a whole bunch of flyers and he was handing them out to people at the bus stop all on his... Campaign. Oh, yeah. On the campaign. Yeah. And... As you were speaking, I was reflecting on that little interaction and how we went and spoke to a lot of the politicians before the last election. And I thought, tying up with your comment, John, what could we do collectively to get a little, I don't know, a little bit more juice out of out of that? Is there multiple Peter Parkers that we mm. get? How do we energise more people in the community mm. to take that sort of approach well that's e exactly what the better bus campaign has been doing in the west it's basically about with the support of the councils we ran four forums in the lead up to the election where ian and i got to say this is possible what do you reckon and that coming on from the conversation this morning about laura was saying about imagining something different is the first step. So what we're saying to people is you could have a bus service that connects you up. It's not the way we're doing it now is not inevitable and it's changeable within a manageable time frame. So that's the first step. And the next step is now you know you want that, how can we help you get your voice out there? And so that's what that's what the vital complement to academics or council officers is community voices and that's exactly what the people in the west have been doing letterboxing leafleting talking to people making buses sexy they had a for transport equity week they had a, a bus ball where they you know that there's young young people who are saying we want our life <laughs> Well, then they knew who Harry Styles was. So, they, uh, um, this so is that's the sort of thing, exactly. And that's the sort of thing that councils can do and councils can help their communities do. So when the, council, the communities come to you and say, we need this many flyers or we need this, you know, small resources, I think it's incumbent on councils to say, yep, where do we sign? Um, John, I was just wondering, sort of listening to sort of some of the previous uh, presentations and this conversation about whether there's something in Innes's transport's sort of role in supporting daily living, mm. uh, cost of living crisis sort of front of mind in a lot of people's minds, and whether or not rather than sort of wanting better buses, um, is there an angle where you encourage community uh, anger at the fact that better buses are available with existing resources, but the government's just too stupid to put the right service <laughs> in place. And if, if there's something in there, and particularly in the West, where yeah. if you look at the last election, a lot of pushback on Labor seats, you sort of listed a couple of the big projects that haven't been delivered because they've been delivered in Sandbelt and sort of those other important seats yeah. in the southeast. So whether or not there's a different tack yeah. that government's not support providing support for daily living because it's being silly about how it's spending its public yeah. transport dollar now. Yeah. And if only it did this, it would support the people better. Yeah. I think 
I think that's right. I think in your public communications, you might not use exactly that language, but I think that's the, really the message is what does it mean for a government that is so dependent on those seats in the West and <coughs> with a slight change in the way the politics works. You know, if the Liberal vote had been up slightly, then Labor would have lost some of those seats in the West this time round. And so it's, it's making them aware of that vulnerability. It's, you know, though it's a hard ask, you know, I just have to tell the story of one of the MPs out in the West who I went to see. She, they'll remain nameless, but they, they said, oh, you've come all the way out here to talk to us from Melbourne University, but you're from Melbourne University. What, what's buses to you? And it was sort of like somehow all this idea that we who have access to cars and to some public transport are somehow not going to care about other people. And I think that's the, the message is that we, we all want a much more equitable society and we want that care. And that's, that's the voice is to say, as our responsibility to people in the West who are struggling, is that we want to make sure that they have an alternative to that third car or that second car. And that's where the cost of living comes in and that becomes a motivator. All right, last question and we're going to have to be tight. John, on uh, Saturday night, the Melbourne Conservatorium of Music had a Big Bang concert and one of the musicians wrote a piece of music. And what was it about? It was about the 472 bus right. and why it was so crap. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 